Uh, okay, continuing with Philippians 2 here. And we kind of covered, well, we did cover, what does it really mean to work out your own salvation in Philippians 2? It's the same thing as Philippians 1. It means God is operating in you through the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ so that Christ is put on display and you're living as Christ and your uh, situation is just for magnifying the gospel. Everything's just a platform for the gospel. Uh, and that is, again, not eternal salvation. It's just the victory that salvation provides. And this is not a demand on us. Again, it all comes out of a realization of what we have in Christ. It just means that you're well fed, you know. You're satisfied with Christ. And when you're satisfied with Christ, it's just it changes the direction of things. It changes the way you think and what you care about and what you talk about. All of that, right? And uh, how much that's put on display is really up to the Lord. He gives us each a, po a measure. You know, we don't want to compare ourselves with others. We don't want to compare ourselves to Paul and say, you know, every situation he got in, everybody got saved around him. And his reputation went out everywhere. And, you know, that's Paul. That's, he is the... Uh, minister of grace for the Gentiles. It's, his role was so significant and he suffered accordingly, you know. Um, we may have a more quiet situation. Uh, what the Lord is looking at is the heart. Um, the widow's two mites are every bit uh, as grand to the Lord as the more extravagant displays because it's all of his grace. You don't get to decide how much influence you have. You don't get to decide how much you think about Jesus. It's according to your growth and according to revelation. And that's according to his choice and placement of you in the body and whether how much supply there is for you. You know, the way the blood flows in the body and life flows in the body Certain organs get more. It's just the way it is. That's him. So, whatever you do, don't read along with Philippians and turn it into a demand for yourself. Other than let it generate in you an appetite for more. And a couple people have said this lately on my wall, responding to the teachings, saying, you know... My whole way of looking at the Bible is changing. I see Christ now. I don't go to it to look for things to do anymore. I see that it's God really wanting to show me Christ. And when I'm focused on Him, the atmosphere has changed. You know, and that's my words, but other people are saying similar things. And that's really it. We are not here taking up a demand or putting demands on each other we are here in grace and grace reduces the demand on you and puts it all on christ's shoulders it literally cancels the demand on you we're crucified so there's nothing to measure uh just thought i'd put that in there as a word of encouragement um, okay, so how much of this salvation we enjoy and exhibit, that's up to the Lord. All we want to do is keep learning and keep growing. Uh, not so much paying attention to the fruit, but to the root, which is Christ, the root of David. Uh, he's the root and the offspring. He's the source of it all, and he's also what comes out. Um, okay. 
So then he says, you know, yes, and if I be offered on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice. I I joy and I rejoice with you all. For the same cause also you rejoice with me. Um, and that is a reference to the drink offering. Some translations, I think it's the NASB says, even if I'm poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. And that's why I said, you know, fellowship always brings me back to the priesthood. I can't help it because Paul kept doing it. <laughs> and this is one example. The drink offering was, an, was a drink of wine, a cup of wine, poured out on the sacrifices, representing like an overflow of the priest's enjoyment. Now, I, the priests didn't actually, I don't think, enjoyed their service. It was all a picture of what we now have in Christ as reality. We wouldn't have enjoyed serving in the tabernacle, I don't believe. But everything they were doing was a picture of spiritual realities that are fulfilled in Christ and in the fellowship. And again, God provides an offering and requires an offering. He requires what he provides, which is Christ typified by all the offerings, burnt offering, meal offering, peace offering, sin offering, and trespass offering, right? And then on those offerings, on some of them, there was a drink offering poured out. And that represented the priest's uh, enjoyment. Like, if you're in the fellowship and Christ is the offerings, and you've been handling Christ, and you've been recognizing and appreciating everything he is to God and for you, that produces joy, right? Which is likened to wine. Um, you know, the wine at the wedding feast. It is the enjoyment of our union with him. And it's uh, produced from God's satisfaction with him too. It's a mix of our satisfaction and his satisfaction. It's called the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. And it's a drink offering to be poured out on the sacrifices. It's just interesting. So I can't get much deeper into it than that. I think there's more to it than that, but that's all I can understand. But Paul said, even if I am being poured out as a drink offering. So he was saying, look, through my enjoyment of Christ, which is clearly on display in Philippians, the happiest letter in the New Testament, uh, I've become a drink offering to be poured out. Like, I'm full of satisfaction. And it's on the sacrifice and service of your faith. Our faith is our sacrifice. It's our priestly service. What is our priestly service? To believe in Jesus. When we believe in Jesus, we are brought near to God through Him. He becomes, He is our offering. He offered Himself once and for all. Right? Uh, for our sins and perfected us forever. But he also brings us near. And every time we come to God, he's always the way. Anytime we approach the Father, it's through Christ. It's in Christ. He is our representative. He's our person before the Father. Everything he is is credited to us, and we are a fragrance of Christ unto God. That's another offering, a priesthood picture of the fellowship, where Paul says we are a fragrance or a sweet savor of Christ unto God. That speaks of the burnt offering. He is all the offerings. Okay? And our faith is the way he becomes our offering. So it's the sacrifice and service of your faith. It's the sacrifice of Christ and our service, our work, is just to believe. And by believing, we are made priests and we are brought near to God. What does a priest do? Come near to God. <laughs> That's our priestly service, is to come near based on the sacrifice of Christ, which is our faith. And now Paul is saying, I am a drink offering. That through my death, I could be poured out as a sacrifice. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, I could be poured out on your service and sacrifice of faith. I, I don't know if that's literal or not, but he's saying there's a mutual rejoicing there. Because I rejoice... 
right? Even if I am offered upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I joy and rejoice with you all. And for the same reason, also you joy and rejoice with me. It's you joy and rejoice, and I joy and rejoice. Uh, he's talking about the joy unspeakable and full of glory. He's saying there's a finishing touch through the drink offering that just overflows and becomes joy that causes rejoicing uh and it, it's got something to do with them being fellow partakers with him of grace in that relationship um he's there suffering for them he says uh you know don't fade at my sufferings for you which are your glory in ephesians it's crazy there's more going on in the spirit than we realize we don't understand how much Christ is being processed through all of our experiences and what God is gaining out of it and what he's doing in the body of Christ. It's more than just the words we speak. We are, there's an operation of the measure in each one part, right? According to Ephesians 4, for the building up of the body of Christ. It's got to do with the flow of the life, the bountiful supply of the spirit of Jesus Christ, the measure of that spirit operating in each part. Um, that causes the growth and the increase of the body unto the building up of itself in love. God knows what all that means. We don't. He sees the body not only as all the people, but also as an organism. It's real. And he knows what the joints are supplying and what, how the life is passing and flowing. And he knows all the situations that are required for the maximum growth and it's not just for the growth of the individual it's the growth of the body that he's focused on so this kind of shows a little bit behind the scenes spiritually speaking and i don't want to over spiritualize it but paul's situation being in prison had was very much strategic for god's point of view to get paul to become the joint of the rich supply. I mean, his epistles from prison are the richest things ever written because he's shut up under revelation. He doesn't have the distractions of his life and the riots and the, all the stuff. He's in prison. He's stuck. And we talked about being shut up under Christ. That's being shut up under revelation so that Christ becomes your enjoyment the most. The more you're shut up under Christ, the and he is the only thing you have the more opportunity he has to pour through you so it is very practical in terms of what god was doing to have paul brought into this situation so that the high peak of revelation could be released through paul you know the vision of god's eternal purpose and all that it's pouring out as a rich supply from him and he's becoming a drink offering. And his ministry is producing their faith and also uh, it, their faith is a sacrifice and service, their priestly service, and he's becoming a drink offering. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about it. It's just, uh, there's more to these verses than we think. There's much more spiritual reality going on. Um, then we have words to describe. And I guess I'm just showing you, don't just glance past these verses. And go, You know, there's so much more to it than what we realize. We're just scratching the surface of the kind of revelation that is in Christ um, in these words. Anyway, he says, But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may have good, be of good comfort when I know your estate. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own and not the things which are Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ. But you know the proof of him that as a son with the Father, he has served with me in the gospel. Him therefore I hope to send presently as so soon as I shall see how it goes with me. By trusting the Lord, I also myself shall come shortly. And we know he didn't. But, uh, so that shows that the apostle doesn't know everything, right? He doesn't, you know, 
just because you have a relationship with the Lord doesn't mean you always know what's going on. Um, but he says he needs to know their state. And uh, he said, I'm going to send Timothy. And Timothy is special because there are so few who will genuinely or naturally care for your state because they're all seeking their own things. And he's talking about ministers. Hold on. Uh, he's talking about ministers, servants of the Lord. He's saying they care for their own things. And uh, it's really easy to be divided in ministry. And on the one hand, be a gospel preacher, but on the other hand, building something and caring for yourself. And none of us are exempt from it. You know, um, none of us are altruistic like Jesus or Paul or Timothy. Uh, but there are varying degrees, you know. But what produces the genuine care for someone else, the, the saints of saints? Well, the gospel. It's all a matter of revelation. I mean, there's nothing, it's not about Timothy being a special kind of caring person. It's totally based on, again, what is it that you approve? Is your love abounding in all wisdom and discernment to approve the things which are excellent? Can you discern things spiritually? Are you locked down in your situation? You know, some people are just so divided that they're defiled. And they may be the busiest workers in ministry there is, you know, but it's just all self-interest. And of course, I've seen that on YouTube, unlike anything I've ever, I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff, but on YouTube, people have pretty much transferred the Facebook narcissism to a so-called ministry and made it all into merchandise. Uh, I don't know what to say. And, and, and what I discovered is that only a handful actually care about anything but their own platform. And that's why they perceive that they're being attacked when you ask them a question or, you know, they're just super defensive. Uh, they won't answer for their teaching. They will not take any kind of correction. And I'm not talking about just from me. You just watch the way they respond to their subs. Just totally defensive. Are you calling me a liar, taking it personally? You know, it, it, always reducing it down to a personal thing. Like if people ask me what I teach, I try to give them the answer from the word. Okay, well, this is why I teach that. But what I see with others is, what, are you calling me a liar? Who are you to tell me? I guess the love of many is growing cold, just like the Bible prophesied. This is it. You're the example. I'm banning you, you know. I mean, I do ban people if they're intentionally causing dissension on my channel or bringing false doctrine and they're not going to be, you know, listened to and I can tell. But uh, if they're not going to listen to any reason. But I'm talking about when your loyal subs are saying, look, I don't understand why you're doing this. And you're answering in such a personally offended way and saying things like, well, I guess the love of the many is growing cold and stuff like that. And it's just ridiculous. And I've seen it with almost all the channels uh, that everybody knows about, you know, the bigger the channel, it seems the worse it is. Um, these are not people that are concerned about the state of the saints. They care for their, they're seeking their own things. And it's just clear. It's not, I don't have to say anything to it anymore. It's so obvious and it's becoming more obvious. And that's because the Lord wants to manifest it. Because there's some people who are not clear yet that are being defiled by their contact with some of these ministries. And so the Lord is letting it all kind of hang out so that people will, you know, this is the time where the judgment begins in the house of God and he's cleaning things up. That's not to say these people aren't believers, but 
our work is tested, you know. Uh, the day will declare it. Um, anyway, Timothy was different, right? Uh, and he says, I trust in the Lord, I will come safely, but I suppose it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. That is a mouthful. He's a messenger that was sent from the church at Philippi to take care of Paul's needs. And he says, For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because you had heard that he'd been sick. For indeed he was sick nigh unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only me, him only, but uh, also on me, that I would have, so I won't have sorrow upon sorrow. So this is a glimpse, by the way, that there is still heaviness of heart with Paul. You see him enjoying a Christ, and that's what he's showing them. But it's not like he didn't have sorrow and affliction, you know. Uh, it's a mix. There, it's the fellowship of the sufferings of Christ. And uh, don't let anyone deceive you into thinking, like some people will try to present themselves as more spiritual than they are, and they're just being phony. You know, oh, I'm happy, praise God all the time. God is good all the time, you know. Like, uh, oh, I'm not offended. I love everybody in Jesus' name. And yet, in the back, they're totally backstabbing and, and doing all kinds of stuff, you know. No, let's just be who we are. And so Paul mentions his sorrows here. And he's not afraid to share that side with them. But what's interesting about Epaphroditus is he was sick nigh unto death. And his concern was that he could die there and then the church wouldn't know what happened to him. And he was worried about their hearts. <laughs> you know, they're at risk associating with Paul and sending Epaphroditus was a sign of uh, endorsement, you know. So... Epaphroditus is aware of that, of the stigma on Paul and sort of the precarious situation that the church is in. Um, and now he's sick and he's away from his home church. And again, he's concerned about them more than himself. Only the gospel can do that. Don't, exp that's why I guess I started this with don't compare yourself. Don't be like, I should be like Epaphroditus and be more caring. <laughs> no. Remember, it's the root, not the fruit. What is the root? The bountiful supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, which was pouring out of Paul's ministry as a drink offering. There was a supply there for all this. It didn't come from the people. It came from Christ for, the, for that situation. Don't compare only admire and don't admire people admire the work of Christ right um, because for the work of Christ he was nigh unto death not regarding his own life to supply your lack of service towards me what he's just saying there is he's the one filling in all the gaps you know in the King James it sounds like you lack in service towards me but what he's just saying is no it's we're all aware that he's the one standing in your stead representing you to me and he's appreciated um, but here we see Paul, Timothy and Epaphroditus all uh, filled with the bowels of Christ remember how I long after you all in the inward parts of Christ Jesus this is not Timothy and Epaphras and Paul on display it's Christ on display and he's richly operating in that situation. You cannot reproduce that. But when you see him say, I have none that will naturally care for your state for all seek their own things and not the things of Jesus Christ. We can at least say, Lord, supply me with your spirit and give me eyes to see so that I'm not like that. You know? So there is an admonition there. Um, but again, we're not comparing ourselves. All right, well, this is all I have to say today about this one. Um, I'm going to get on to chapter three shortly. Take care.